The information contained in this podcast is an expression of opinion and does not constitute investment advice. This is the Gold Money Podcast with Alistair McLeod, keeping you up to date with expert opinion on precious metals and the markets. Hello, this is Alistair McLeod on behalf of Gold Money. And with me on the line from Boulder, Colorado, is Mike Krieger, uh, who runs a very, very uh, well-followed blog called Liberty Brits Blitzkrieg. Uh, dot com. Uh, welcome to the show, Mike. Oh, thanks. Thanks for having me on. This is a great. Uh, this is a great first time to be with you. So I'm very happy. Well, that's fantastic. Um, I, I was amused at your description um, that you described yourself, I think, as uh, reco- as a recovering Wall Street employee. Tell, <laughs> us, t- tell us a bit about your Wall Street experience. Yeah, sure. Okay. okay. So the reason I the reason I sort of said it that way is be, is for a few things. I mean, number one, I genuinely feel that way in the sense that. You know, I was uh, I was I wouldn't say necessarily indoctrinated, but, um, you know, you, you get thrust into this world of, of, of Wall Street and, and, you know, the, the sort of fast pacedness of it all, the money and the and the lifestyle. And uh, and, you know, it can be very uh, enchanting and addictive. And so by recovering, I sort of mean, you know, when you, I sort of had an awakening, I sort of realized how the system uh, operates on a macro level, whether it's central banking or or, or the political structure. And sort of the role that Wall Street plays in that, you know, it's it's a it's a key middleman, it's a key support system of the of the of the greater power economic political power structure. And once I realized that, I really couldn't uh, I couldn't continue to live my life the way I did, uh, career wise or anything. So so I left. So ever since it's sort of coming to terms with you know um, you know how I used to view the world and how I view the world now. In addition, I I, I feel like there are a lot of people out there that also have left Wall Street or are considering leaving Wall Street or are unhappy on Wall Street, that they can relate to that statement. So that's really, that's really why I, I wrote it that way. Well, I, yes, I think it's undoubtedly true that uh, you know, quite, a, quite a lot of people um, have had a sort of conventional uh, education when it comes to economics. And you have an economics degree as well, I think. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, sometimes I joke about that. I had a few, maybe one or two classes where I uh, where I feel like I actually learned something. But um, yeah, no, I have an econo- undergraduate economics degree from from university. That with a, a double major in Spanish. So yeah, I mean, I was you know I was taught economics at a at a good you know fine institution here in the states um, from the from the standpoint that it's taught. And you know I you know then I worked in in as you know the financial services industry, Wall Street, Lehman Brothers, and Sanford Bernstein for ten years. And uh, yeah, I mean, I pretty much applied absolutely nothing that I learned uh, <laughs> in my job. Well, that's um, uh, that is interesting because it's not just a question of um, you know an employee w- working in Wall Street and then sort of questioning the values. I mean, it's the whole of your educational background you've had to overturn. I mean, I'm assuming you weren't educated in the economics of uh, the Austrian school, but um, you know maybe the neoclassicists. I mean, so it's actually quite a, a change, isn't it, Mike? Yeah, it's it's interesting that you bring that up. I've written about this before in the past. I recall, you know, um, the, the way that you know you were sort of you were sort of uh, introduced to economic thought. It was always, um, you know, either it's a, a monetarist, let's say, standpoint, or or a, or a fiscal standpoint, or Keynesian, or Friedman, let's say. But but the premise that I found behind both of those was um, when there's a problem. Or, or generally speaking, with an economy, you can either use tax and spend and you know policy to to adjust, or you could use central banking uh, monetary policy. But it, but it was always this framework of uh, of top down sort of central planning. So there was a t- there was never even uh, a mention that you could just leave things be and and let the market figure it out. That's 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 the more interesting thing when I reflect back upon it. Yeah, I know. And um, it's sort of the, the, the tendency with uh, Keynesian uh, economics is to try and develop more and more tools of intervention rather than, as you say, just sort of stand back and uh, and, and let people run their own lives. Um, and I mean, one of the greatest fallacies, it seems to me, is that, uh, <laughs> you know, somehow government is meant to do a better job of spending our money than we do ourselves. And, you know, I find that one a little difficult. 
field. Anyway, moving on slightly, um, you must be really interested as an ex-commodities dealer seeing what's going on in gold and silver at the moment. I mean, uh, as we speak, I think gold is knocking on the $1,700 level trying to get through. Uh, Silver has um, had a very, very powerful run and um, just refuses to break back down below $32. It's currently, I think, $32.20 as as we speak. Um, this uh, This is great stuff, isn't it? Yeah, you know when I when I look at the gold, the precious metals markets, gold and silver, and and I think about you know the backdrop, it, it is so powerfully bullish to me right now that um, you know it, it's underappreciated. I think, and, and and let me let me go into a few things. So first of all, as we all know, uh, us that study the precious metals markets, you, you've had a consolidation in gold for about a year, in silver for for about eighteen months, really or more, um, and so that's led to a. Um, an attitude, at least here in the States, for sure, of co- total complacency, where the, the, even the diehard precious metals bulls are sort of so beaten down and bored and frustrated that they, are, they always are waiting for the next raid or the next smash. And then the general public is completely out to lunch. You know, when I looked this morning at the chart, what's so interesting is the chart of gold in euros is, uh, is, a, is right back at last September's high. So we're, we're really close for gold breaking out in euros. So in, on the continent, I'm sure the attitude is much different than it is in the States. And I think that's important for people over there to even realize that, that people here have no – they're not even thinking about it. No, I think that's, that's, that is interesting. Um, I mean, there's no doubt about it that um, – a lot of the players in the precious metals i mean this is this is my feeling of it i'd be interested in your views uh, a lot of the, the the players were were basically in their uh, short term or they would describe themselves as investors and an investor by definition is someone who buys something with a view to selling it right. um, and uh, so uh, you know people like that are only interested in a game that's in play that's running as it were and so they've sort of rather gone from the scene completely um, and it's just less left the few diehards you know, I mean obviously they're, they're bound to be a few people who sort of unquestioningly unquestioningly support gold and silver but then uh, there are people perhaps like uh, you and me um, who follow uh, a more sort of if you like libertarian or Austrian economic philosophy and therefore have a have we have, have, have a grasp of um, the money side of things and how that relates to gold. I mean, we're about the only people left standing in this market at the moment. So would you think that's a fair analysis? Yeah. So, so what I try to explain to people is for the next, for the next big move up, what we really need you know, to break out and, and have another leg higher is, is you need a couple of things. I think one is you just needed um, sentiment to get down to a more reasonable level, and we are definitely there on that front. So it checks that box. The other is a what I like to say um, a sort of spark, a light bulb moment where people realize that maybe it's a new group of people or maybe it's the existing group that already owns some precious metals that decides they need more exposure, and some sort of light bulb will go off in their heads, um, and that will cause a, a marginal money flow into the space. And, uh, and that'll be physical, it'll be futures, it'll be miners, it'll be everything. And I think we are on the, um, on the cusp or the very beginning stages of that happening right now. So, um, so it's, you know, we need to watch very closely and people need to understand that what the central bank bankers, the central planners have been doing is not much but saying they're there. So, so, so most people feel like, well, I don't need to increase my exposure because they're not really doing anything. They're not really expanding the balance sheets. But it looks to me like push is coming to shove, particularly in the euro, in the eurozone with the ECB. And when they actually do something, um, you're going to see. I think you're going to see gold and euros hit new highs, and it's going to be a whole new paradigm for these metals. So, yeah, I think we're there. I think the box, the the you know the the gun is sort of loaded and and ready to go, go off, and uh, there. You make a very interesting comment about a spark to ignite the market. Um, And uh, I note that um, uh, George Soros and uh, Paulson, I can't remember which which Paulson it is, but the one who's who's added to his position. I mean, these guys and Soros is an interesting one because um, his economics is effectively Keynesian so far as I can understand it. Um, And yet he has loaded up on uh, more uh, SPDR uh, ETF. You know, so is that the spark? Do you you think the billionaires are beginning to get 
so um, worried about the situation, perhaps. I'm not sure that's the quite, r- quite the right word, but no. um, you know, they're rather like rats that may be deserting the establishment ship. Do you think we're beginning to see that with those two big names, um, you know, being the first, if you like, into the lifeboat? Sure. Well, I, th- well, I, think, I don't think, I wouldn't say so much with them um, as much as others. So, for example, Soros's fund has been in and out of gold, GLD, on and off forever. Um, and so, yes, they've recently increased their their exposure more. And Paulson has has guessed he's he's sort of doubled or well, not doubled down, but he's increased his already large bet on gold. So these are sort of guys that are have already been there on and off. And and so I don't think it, it's providing the psychological spark um, yet that that we need. Although it's certainly interesting um, movements under the under the surface. Uh, I do, however, believe that in this last year of consolidation, a lot of the wealthy. Um, and that would include probably politicians and Wall Street people, um, all have been have been using this sort of consolidation to buy up uh, precious metals. And you know, I've posted a couple of articles now about how in Italy there's 28,000 pawn shop, you know, basically cash for gold shops, and how in Portugal it's also like one of the big booming businesses. You know, what's happening here is is the poor. Italians and middle class Italians and Portuguese are, are being forced essentially to sell their gold to pay rent and eat food. And guess who's buying it? You know, it's it's people that are aware that they need protection. So to me, this whole consolidation has been sort of a fleecing of the weak holders and unfortunately the poor that need to sell their metals into the hands of those that are aware. And that seems to be drying up though in these a lot of these countries. And that's why I think we're that's partly again why I think we're about to take another leg higher. But I think more than anything else, Alistair, it's gonna be it's gonna be two things. It's going to be price is going to get people back excited. And it's going to be um uh expansion of uh government balance sheets or desperate moves by governments to stimulate their economies. And uh I think both of those are are happening as we speak. Yeah, which um, neat, neatly, I suppose, takes us into, um, if you like, the the problems that uh, that governments in particular face. I mean, we started off with a banking crisis five years ago. We still have a banking crisis. We haven't had the economic recovery to rescue the banking system. And there's no sign of that. If anything, that seems to be disappearing further over the horizon. Meanwhile, the cost of all this, plus the off-balance sheet costs of welfare, are mounting up on, uh, uh, you know, on the government's accounts, uh, and uh, certain governments are finding it very, very hard to to, to fund this. I mean, uh, when is this going to end? Do you think uh, this is yeah. this is a very, very difficult situation, and I I don't think anyone can see a way out of it. No, so so this is why I mean, this is essentially why I put a lot of things in my own life on, on sort of hold to dedicate myself to, um, you know, becoming informed in this, being, I guess, a sort of financial activist um, out there on the, on the Internet and, and et cetera, and, and really is because of the fact that we are in such a dangerous position, um, as you mentioned, one that is has no easy solutions, um, that, you know, it's been my position for years now that this will be the, the shape the world, I guess, um, that we that we will live in in 10 years from now will be nothing like the world we live in today. And um, there's two ways that we could go. One would be, which is, of course, what the power structure is is pushing for. And and you can see this in Europe and you can see this in the United States, which is further centralization of power, um, further demonization of markets and and putting influence and and power into uh, bureaucrats, unelected bureaucrats in a lot of cases, um, to essentially because they know what's best for us. Um, and, and that's one route. And, and you see, you know, the, the trying to crack down on the Internet and surveillance, et cetera. It's very prevalent here in the U.S. And I know in the United Kingdom as well, because I've been following that, too. Like Project in, in, Inject, I just read about. It's very scary. Um, or the other, though, would be a in the ashes of this current system. Um, we, we, we create a more decentralized, um, more free market, more liberty, uh, more freedom society. And I do think that's possible because of things like the Internet and social media and all of these things allow us to actually connect with other individuals across the world and and actually change the world for a decentralized future. So, So this is really the battle. And I think every single citizen of every single country in the world needs to understand it's going to be different. Do you want more centralization and a feudalistic type society or do you want a more free, dynamic society for the world? And of course, I go for the latter. But this is a war, and we need to all understand that, and we need to pick sides now. 
Yeah, uh, I, th- I think that analysis is fair, but it sort of rather suggests we have a choice in the matter. Um, I mean, do you... It sort of implies that you think that we can sort of, you know, become more and more controlled um, and uh, the system can be, uh, if you like, stopped from falling over <laughs> as long as that process of increasing control continues. And this undoubtedly is, is um, uh, you know, what the Keynesians, I think, um, are in effect recommending, you know, for goodness sake, let's not have the market right. actually impose disciplines on us. Um, I mean, but that can't continue forever, can they? I mean, sooner or later, it's got to stop. Sooner or later, they, you know, it's going to fail. Right. So so what's, what I find very interesting, and, and I don't know your position on this, but obviously I'm a gold and silver person, but I've been following the sort of Bitcoin story very closely as well and how that's gained traction and, and, and you know, how WikiLeaks was actually able to continue to operate and accept donations via Bitcoin when, you know, Visa and Bank of America and all the payment processors cut them off. And that got me thinking, you know, this is really interesting what's happening. There's obviously this movement to um, move towards more gold and silver. There's obviously um, uh, this Bitcoin movement. And so what I think is is happening is under the surface, as we speak, as things are crumbling, competitive, you know, different currencies are coming up, different philosophies. People are actually transacting in Bitcoin, for example. And I know with gold money, you used to be able to do that. I'm not sure if that's still an option, but um, to pay in, the, you know, like digital grams. But the, but the point is, I, I think the more infrastructure we lay down for alternatives – while the system is panicking to stay alive, the better chance we have to have these alternatives be the mainstream when the system craters, ultimately. So, so that's how I, I see it. Yeah, yeah. I, no, I, I, I go along with that. I mean, the, the, um, because the bit, I mean, really, I think what you're referring to here, Mike, is the big risk that we face at the end of the day, is that governments do not actually understand, and particularly central bankers, understand the risks they are taking with currency, with the paper currency, which is only backed by the promise, the unwritten promise by the governments that uh, the paper currency for which they're responsible actually has any value. Now, this is interesting because that could be tested in the Eurozone because there you've got, what, 17 governments. Half of them seem to be bust. The other half seem to be backing off. You know, who stands behind the paper currency? What's going to happen to the euro as the eurozone disintegrates, which looks quite a likely outcome? Or the alternative outcome is Mr. Draghi gets his way and uh, prints money like fury, which will probably underline, undermine the euro anyway. Um, you know, so if the sequence of events is that um, things happen in the Eurozone first to provide a lesson for the rest of us. Do you think we'll learn from that before it is too late? Well, I mean, I, I think, I think we're, we, are, we are learning every day in the sense that I believe more and more people are waking up um, to what's going on and trying to uh, remove themselves from the system. But it needs to be more, of course. And, um, and, and again, I don't, I don't sort of – my view is, is very uh, – I sort of take a very hard stance in the sense that I, is, I already am looking way beyond the sort of collapse of this monetary system. I don't even like to even ar- talk about, oh, well, the monetary system is going to collapse. I mean, I guarantee I have that as 100 percent certainty. So what, what my concern is, again, is that we need to not allow these same clowns that are, are putting us into this pit, that are burying us in this fiat uh, feudalism to be able to control the debate once they – um, once they, once all their paper money project burns into flames, you know, we need to not allow them to say, oh, you know, it's, it's, we blame the gold speculators or we blame this, you know, this or that it's their fault. We all need to point fingers at them right now and start to figure out solutions so that we can, uh, determine our own destiny and what we, what kind of system we want afterwards. So I don't even like, I don't, you know, I don't know how long they can drag this on or not, but this system is terminal. And uh, it's it's probably going to go up in flames within the next few years. So, you know, that's that's essentially why I'm in cold. It's right. <laughs> no, I can understand that. So I think if I can put what you're saying another way, Mike, um, you know, if the eurozone blows up first, 
that isn't going to change the course of events um, and the views, if you like, in the, in, in the Fed and the U.S. Treasury. It's not going to change anything. They're, they're, going, they're going to sort of maybe intensify what they're doing, perhaps, rather than sort of stand back and think, hold on a minute, we've got to rethink this right from the ground up. Oh, sure. No, these guys are, uh, I mean, everything I've learned about watching these central planners that are currently in power is that they are 100% convinced they're smarter than everyone else and they know what's best for everyone else. So, so a person like that, a personality like that, when they're wrong, um, they don't admit they're wrong, right? They say, they blame someone else or they try to cover it up or they do more of the same or they crack down on people that disagree with them. Um, so that's what, you know, that's what I've seen. That's what I would expect. I would expect absolutely no lessons to be learned whatsoever from the top. I would expect that when they're proven wrong for them to clamp down further and double down on their stupidity, which is what they've done. And so, look, we need to be sovereign human beings, uh, sovereign uh, states. Um, you know, we need to stop being complicit little, 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 little farm animals and, and, and be human beings, you know? And, uh, and, and, you know, and essentially my, my view as well is that when people, enough people are aware, awake, and they decide they've had enough, you know, the power structures can't continue to do whatever they want. And so that's what we need to happen. And, and it needs to be peaceful and it needs to be an intellectual revolution. And it needs to be, um, people in different countries connecting with one another and saying, we're, you know, you're not my enemy. My government is the enemy, essentially, in some ways. And that's, that's, I, that's my, my view, at least. Right. Okay. That's, that is extremely clear. Now, um, I think von Mises, um, his, his analysis, if he was alive today, of this situation would be, after saying, I told you so, not, not that he ever had that sort of arrogance about him. Right. Uh, but um, I think everything that's happened, uh, he um, uh, would have expected. And certainly if you read human action, it's all written in there. You can see, see what's happening. Um, the conclusion that von Mises came to is that uh, so long as this course is continued, the inevitable result is the destruction of paper money. So that in, a set, in essence um, is what you're saying, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And, and, you know, that's, and when people like look, look at even uh, a, a digital currency, let's say like a Bitcoin, they say, well, this is created out of nothing. And well, it, so is the, so is the money now. And, and someone made a really good point. A friend of mine the other day, he said, we need to think about this. You know, banks and others are getting money at 0%, right? This, this created money that, that has no backing, that is, 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 is vapor at 0% and then lending it at higher percent, 6%, 7%. How can something, right, with no intrinsic value that's created out of thin air be given to one group of, of, of preferred um, players and then they're allowed to lend it at a percentage interest? It's crazy. And so people need to understand the scam. It, 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 the, the money is bad. The whole system is fraud. We need to start over. Um, and we need, you know, the rule of law to be established again in the West. And uh, yeah. I I, th I think yes, exactly. I think Mike, they call it a license to print money. But, anyway. <laughs> but, then, but, then, they, um, but then it gets loaned out, right? But then it gets loaned out at a high percent. I mean, look at exactly. right, look at credit card in the in the states. Credit card interest rates are double digits, high double digits. I mean, and uh, right. yes, and if, if you think if you think if you stayed on Wall Street, how rich you would be. <laughs> right. I mean, look, imagine that. You know, someone let me, someone you know let me borrow something that you create out of thin air, out of vapor at zero percent. Let me lend it to some some poor person at eighteen percent. Isn't that the best scam? I mean. <laughs> Well, it's it's pretty good, isn't it? I mean, I, I no, I, I I I take the point. I mean, I think really, um, I, on a sort of closing note, um, the whole of the sort of central banking franchise system uh, uh, breeds uh, inevitably um, corruption in relationships, really, between the commercial banks and government, and uh, the two things sort of get so close together. Um, <laughs> You know, and one lot don't understand. I mean, the government don't un probably don't understand um, what's actually happening to them. I mean, you know, they turn around and ask, you know, we got a financial problem. I go and ask my banker and see what he says about it. And of course, the banker will give him an answer which is very much uh, supports his vested interest. But anyway, we could go on and on about that. Tell me, uh, Mike, um, is there any other way in which uh, our listeners can find you? 
um, you, because you've got libertyblitzkrieg.com, which I think I mispronounced, actually, in, oh, yeah. in the intro- introduction. No, no, yeah, no problem. So, yeah, so I launched a, a blog site called libertyblitzkrieg.com. Um, uh, you can just search my name, Michael Krieger. You can search Liberty Blitzkrieg, whatever you want. Um, and I launched in April, and it's the, the, the support I've gotten, the views, the comments, everything has been outstanding. So for those listeners that are not familiar with uh, – with my website, but have probably read my articles on Zero Hedge because I've been posting there and I continue to for, for over two years now. Um, you can you can uh, find me at that site if you want to send me a message. There's a contact tab on the on the menu bar where you can go in there and, and send me an email through that, and I'd be happy to respond and engage in dialogue. And more importantly, what I suggest people doing is signing up. It's, it doesn't cost you anything. On the right sidebar, you sign up. You get my every blog post I do goes right to your email box. And you can also follow me on Twitter. I've started actively using Twitter as of a few months ago, and I find it a very powerful tool to connect with people and get information across. So um, I would, I would, I would, uh, if you like what you hear on this interview, I would encourage you to please go to my site and sign up to uh, to get my material or send me a message. Well, um, I, I I think that's great, and um, Mike, thank you very much indeed. And um, let us hope um, that you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, look, I mean, I'm actually kind of optimistic. I think that we can establish a better world afterwards. But no, I don't think there's any reforming or tweaking or anything that can be done to save this system as it is. No, I, I don't. Nor do I think it's worth saving. No, I think I, I, I would I would personally agree with you there. Anyway, Mike, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Alistair. I appreciate it. Subscribe to the Gold Money newsletter at www.goldmoney.com to receive email updates on new articles, videos, and iTunes podcasts from our Gold Research section. I learned uh, <laughs> in my job. Well, that's um, uh, that is interesting because it's not just a question of um, you know an employee w- working Wall Street and then sort of questioning the values. I mean, it's the whole of your educational background you've had to overturn. I mean, I'm assuming you weren't educated in the economics of uh, the Austrian school, but um, you know maybe the neoclassicists. I mean, so it's actually quite a, a change, isn't it, Mike? Yeah, it's it's interesting that you bring that up. I've written about this before in the past. I recall, you know. Um, the way that, you know, you were sort of, you were sort of uh, introduced to economic thought, it was always, um, you know, either it's a a monetarist, let's say, standpoint or, or, or a fiscal standpoint or Keynesian or Friedman, let's say. But, but the premise that I found behind both of those was, um, when there's a problem, or, or generally speaking, with an economy, you can either use tax and spend and, you know, policy to, to adjust, or, The information contained in this podcast is an expression of opinion and does not constitute investment advice. This is the Gold Money Podcast with Alistair McLeod, keeping you up to date with expert opinion on precious metals and the markets. Hello, this is Alistair McLeod on behalf of Gold Money. And with me on the line from Boulder, Colorado, is Mike Krieger, uh, who runs a very, very uh, well-followed blog called LibertyBlitzkrieg.com. Uh, uh, welcome to the show, Mike. Oh, thanks, thanks for having me on. This is, a great, uh, this is a great first time to be with you, so I'm very happy. Well, that's fantastic. Um, I, I was amused at your description um, that you described yourself, I think, as, uh, reco- as a recovering Wall Street employee. <laughs> with you know, um, you know how I used to view the world and how I view the world now. In addition, I, I I feel like there are a lot of people out there that also have left Wall Street or are considering leaving Wall Street or are unhappy on Wall Street that they can relate to that statement. So that's really that's really why I, I wrote it that way. Well, I, yes, I think it's undoubtedly true that uh, you know quite a, quite a lot of people um, have had a sort of conventional uh, education when it comes to economics, and you have an economics degree as well, I think. 
Yeah, that's correct. I mean, sometimes I joke about that. I had a few, maybe one or two classes where I uh, where I feel like I actually learned something. But um, yeah, no, I have an econo- undergraduate economics degree from from university. That with a, a double major in Spanish. So yeah, I mean, I was you know I was taught economics at a, at a good you know fine institution here in the states um, from the from the standpoint that it's taught. And you know I you know then I worked in, in as you know the financial services industry, Wall Street, Lehman Brothers, and Sanford Bernstein for ten years. And uh, yeah, I mean, I pretty much applied absolutely nothing that I tell us a bit about your Wall Street experience. Yeah, sure. Okay. okay. So the reason I the reason I sort of said it that way is be, is for a few things. I mean, number one, I genuinely feel that way in the sense that you know I was uh, I was I wouldn't say necessarily indoctrinated, but um, you know you you get thrust into this world of, of of Wall Street and and you know the the sort of fast pacedness of it all, the money and the and the lifestyle and. Uh, and, you know, it can be very uh, enchanting and addictive. And so by recovering, I sort of mean, you know, when you, wh- I sort of had an awakening, I sort of realized how the system uh, operates on a macro level, whether it's central banking or, or, or the political structure and sort of the role that Wall Street plays in that. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a key middleman. It's a key support system of the, of the, ge- of the greater power, economic political power structure. And once I realized that, I really couldn't, uh, I couldn't continue to live my life the way I did, uh, career-wise or anything. So, so I left. So ever since it's sort of coming to terms, you could use central banking uh, monetary policy. But it, but it was always this framework of, uh, of top-down sort of central planning. So there was, a t- there was never even uh, a mention that you could just leave things be and, and let the market figure it out. That's, that's, that's the more interesting thing when I reflect back upon it. Yeah, I know. And um, it's sort of the, the, the tendency with uh, Keynesian uh, economics is to try and develop more and more tools of intervention rather than, as you say, just sort of stand back and uh, and, and let people run their own lives. Um, and I mean, one of the greatest fallacies, it seems to me, is that, uh, <laughs> you know, somehow government is meant to do a better job of spending our money than we do ourselves. And, you know, I find that one a little difficult. Anyway, moving on slightly, um, you must be really interested as an ex-commodities dealer seeing what's going on in gold and silver at the moment. I mean, uh, as we speak, I think gold is 